let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, God. Thank you that um, Father, man doesn't live on bread alone or hamburgers or chips or chicken. Father, but we, we grow, we mature, and we need every word that comes out of your mouth. So I pray right now, Lord, would you speak to each individual in this place in a language they would understand this morning? Would you show us some things we need to see, God, and let us hear some things we need to hear, Father, in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Hey, um, look, if you are uh, uh, new here, uh, or you're just visiting this week, we're kind of continuing on from uh, a conversation we started having last week. So I don't want to go over old ground, but um, last week we talked about uh, us as a gathering. We're nearly, next year, I think we're celebrating 10 years. Next year, we'll have our 10th anniversary. We've gone from the Canelo Bar Sports and Aquatic Club to, to here, and it's been a bit of a journey. So last week, we talked about the journey we've been on up to this point. Uh, we talked about this particular space that we're in. Um, long story short, um, we didn't follow, I guess, the traditional journey of, uh, hey, we've got a bunch of people in the rooms sort of getting too small, and now we need a bigger room. Uh, before we even started going hard at the GSAC, God had already spoken to us and brought us to this place and, and said to us that, you know, I'm going to give you guys some space here and you're going to have a, a church here. This was years before we got in here, a couple of years before we got in here. So anyway, we talked a bit about that last week to just dive home the thought that um, we're, we're here because God wants us here. Amen? We're, we're in this particular location and this place, not because we thought it would be great to have a church here, but God... For some reason, and I'm not God and I don't pretend to understand everything about God and the way God thinks, but for whatever reason, he thought that this was where he needed a gathering of his people, a gathering of believers, a church. And uh, so each of you that have felt that God has called you here, I, I hope that you have a sense of, uh, I guess, divine destiny about the fact that you're here. You're not just, we're not just here because, hey, we... And that's what Christians do. You know, we, we get saved, we come to faith, then we go to a church, and then we, you know, we pray, and we read a Bible, and so on, and we just do these things like there's some kind of sort of religious ritual that we go through, uh, when there's a bigger picture than that. There's more to it than that. My, my life and your life is, uh, it, it's, it's pretty much like the, I don't know if you can see where you are, that tiny little uh, wrinkle there in the curtain. That's, that's your life, and that's my life. It's got a start date and an end date. And it's not going to be long. And when you're at the beginning of it, it feels like it's going to go on forever. Once you get past a certain tipping point, you realize it's running out real, real quick. And pretty soon I won't be here anymore. And that's not for a follower of Christ. That's not a depressing thought. Uh, it's just a reality that life has a, a use-by date for all of us. And my, and my life and your life is like that little uh, ripple in the sheet. The world, God, was, God was doing things well before you got here. I know some of us find that really, really hard to believe. Some Christians find it really hard to believe that God could do anything without us being here and doing what we do. But God was doing amazing things before we got here. And here's the other thing, the kicker. Once we go, God's going to keep doing amazing things. Amen? He's going to keep doing things because uh, it, this, is, this is his gig, bottom line. Uh, humanity is his gig. Uh, time and eternity is his gig. We are invited to partake and participate in it with him. But at the end of the day, God is going to have his way. Amen? God's going to do what God wants to do. But we get this incredible little thing called life, called time, where we get these invitations to participate with him in the big picture of what he wants to do. And for whatever reason, uh, I could have been born in 18th century China, but I wasn't. Or 14th century Rome, I was born and I'm here today now in Ganelava, in Lismore, 2024, and I have this sense that I'm here for such a time as this, whatever this means. And I think that's the same, and I hope that you feel exactly the same way about your life and your call and purpose and so on. And so I don't want people coming here just thinking, we're just there because this is what religious people do. Amen? If, if you're here because that's what religious people do, you're missing the point. Okay? You're missing the point. We're not, we're not, we don't gather because that's what religious people do. I hope you gather with a sense of expectation and faith that, you know, when we, when we, when we get together, there's, there's something that, you know, Jesus said, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. Now, now, Jesus is with me by myself. But for some reason, he said, but when there's more of you gathered together, I'm there. He, he just said there's something about the dimension of his presence and what he can do that seems to operate greater in community than it just does with me uh, individually. And so... We've been talking last week about that whole picture of how we got here. What I want to do now is look forward to the future and throw a few thoughts out at us and look at not the journey we've had, but maybe the journey we're about to go on. Amen? Exciting? Awesome. That's great. Um, if you've got a, a collection of ancient documents that we Christians call a Bible, 
1,600 years it was written, uh, three continents, yet it all tells this story, all these different authors. Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 6 to 9. So the context of this here is that uh, the Jews have been uh, scattered and they've been... They disobeyed God. The Jewish nation had this history of, of, of crying out to God and God would be merciful to them and save them and then they would forget about God and slip back into whatever the culture around them was doing and then God would withdraw his hand and then they would get oppressed and then they would cry out to God. God in his grace and mercy would come and send a deliver and set them free and they were in this cycle kind of like a washing machine where it just kept on going, going, going. The book of Judges is a great uh, quick snapshot picture of going from the, the penthouse to the outhouse to the penthouse to the outhouse to the penthouse to the outhouse to use an Australian uh, colloquial term. And so when we get to Nehemiah, we've got this story of a man that hears about what's going on in the city of Jerusalem and that the walls had been torn down and that uh, people were, the, the, the Jews that had gone back there were not living uh, the dream, so to speak. And it broke Nehemiah's heart that Jerusalem was in the state that it was in, that that community, that city was in the state that it was. And so he gets news about it and, and, and it breaks his heart, but it doesn't just break his heart to the point where Nehemiah uh, goes, you know what, I'm just going to sit in a corner and cry about the state of the world. Hey, who's ever tempted to want to do that? Sit in the corner and just cry about the state of the world, right? But Nehemiah allowed that, whatever it is that God was doing in his heart, he allowed that feeling, that sense of, of, of what's happening here, that sense of sorrow and lamented disappointment to drive him to get up and to go and do something about it, amen? Go and do something about it. You know, as a church, you know, I, I, I get around, I've, I've been saved now for nearly 30 years and, you know, I, I know uh, in my time, even in the context of church, the world has changed, not just out there, but how many of you know it's changed in the context of church? Yep. Once upon a time, we, we actually looked like one body. We all believed in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. We all believed that we were sinners saved by grace. We all believed this stuff. We all believed that you needed to come to faith in Jesus, that, that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, we believe that. Now we argue over whether Jesus died and do we need faith or does Jesus' death mean that everyone gets to heaven regardless of what they do? There are people that believe that now. You don't even have to come to faith, just you're saved because Jesus died for everybody. And then we're arguing over issues of sexuality. We argue over issues of, of gender. Uh, we're divided over issues of uh, uh, you know, speaking in tongues or whether gifts of the Spirit exist today or who is the Holy Spirit or, or arguing over doctrine. We, we, we're so splintered and divided over so many different things that even the church landscape has changed in the time that I've been a believer. Um, so Nehemiah is walking into a situation where the walls are down and uh, his heart is broken and he's got to do something about it. He's got to do something about it. And this is where we pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6 to 9. And it says, so we rebuilt. We went there to Jerusalem and we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. So it's not finished yet. But we rebuilt this wall. We got our hands dirty and we did something about it. We could sit there and moan, complain and cry, but we realized that that's not necessarily changing anything. We need to do something about things. And I said last week at the end of our service, and I hope you heard the heart of this, that I believe 100% in prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. I'm fully into prayer. But I also believe that prayer sometimes can be a blanket we hide behind in order to actually do nothing else. Nehemiah could have just sat down and just gone, I'm just going to pray for these walls to be built, Lord. I'm praying for Jerusalem. God, would you go into Jerusalem by your spirit and would you make a mighty revival? And would you? But he said, no, it doesn't work like that. I'm going to go and do something, put my hand to the plow, and I, 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 I'm allowing God to move. I'm, I'm sure I'm still praying, but I'm going to go and do something about that. And I think that's part of the problem right now is, is here's the thing. Right? Who wants to see revival? Amen. We all want to see revival, don't we? Well, here's my question. What are you doing to see revival? What are you doing to actually see revival? I, I remember, you, you guys might remember a couple of years ago, the Azusa Street, uh, there was a 100-year celebration in America, uh, Azusa Now. Do you, anyone remember that? Some people from, uh, yep, I've got friends all around the world who went to Azusa Now, and apparently it was an amazing time. Uh, the Koreans led worship in a session for an hour, Korean worship. Then the, you know, the, 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 from Ghana, the Africans got up and led worship in their local tongue. And people from all nations, tribes and tongues gathered together. There were preachers from all ethnicities, but the worship, they told me the worship was amazing. These Koreans are leading worship. We don't even know what they're saying, but we just know they're singing to the Lord and, and thousands, tens of thousands of people getting caught up in it. 
I had some friends that went over there to Azusa now. They came back. They were so excited, pumped. I walked past them one day in the street, and they stopped me. Alan, how you doing? Yeah, I'm great. What have you been up to? They said, we've just got back from Azusa now. I said, fantastic. That's amazing. And they're telling me all these stories. And then I said to them, okay, so, so what are you going to do now? They said, well, we're going to go home, get a bunch of us, and we're going to go into a prayer closet, and we're just going to pray. And I thought, oh, really? There's a time for prayer. I believe that with all my heart. There's a time for action too, amen? There's a time to pray, but there's a time to do things. There's a time to actually get up and do things. And so it says, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But then Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Termites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were really angry. So there were people that really didn't want these walls to be rebuilt. Walls are an interesting, funny thing in the Old Testament. You've got Joshua tearing down walls, and then you've got Nehemiah trying to rally people to build up walls. Anyone like veggie tales? Anyone have seen the veggie tales? You know, one of my favorite ones is the Jericho Wall one. You know, and they're on the roof, keep walking, but you won't knock down our wall. Never that one. It's plain to see that your brains are very small. If you think walking, we'll be knocking down a wall. So there are some walls in society and culture. There are some walls in society and culture that need to be pulled down. Amen. But there are some walls that need to be built up too. What happens if you run around society and culture and you tear down all the things you don't agree with? What's going to be in its place? Well, you've got to build something as well, don't you? You've got to replace that with something else. When we lived in India and we were doing missions work in India, um, a wise man gave me this piece of advice when it came to the Hindus. We, were, we, ministered, we lived in a Muslim uh, 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 village for a, number of year, uh, for, a, for a period of time. Then we lived in a, a, a Buddhist and we lived with Hindus. And, and they told me this advice. He said, now what's going to happen is you're going to go and tell these people about Jesus and they're going to put their hand up and say yes. Why wouldn't they? They've got 33 million gods. Another one's awesome, you know? They're not, it's not like they don't want gods. They've got that many gods. They're coming out their ears. So he said, you're going to go and you're going to tell them about Jesus, and they're going to want that. But he said, what you're, you're going to do, if you start telling them that all their other gods are idols, he said, that what's going to happen is they're going to bite your hand. Right? He said, picture it like a dog. Let's say you've got a dog. And, and, and there's a dog there in front of you, and he's got this bone over there, right? And the bone is dirty and half-chewed and slobbered on and rah, disgusting. But you've got this brand spanking new beautiful bone and it's so nice and juicy and you know, you know that this one is better for the dog. He said, what's going to happen if you go over there and you just grab that old bone and try to take it away? He said, dog's going to bite your hand. But he said, what you do is you take that really good bone and you take it over there and he said, you place that really, really good bone alongside that dirty, mangy bone. He said, what's going to happen is eventually that dog is going to put the old one out of its mouth, chew the new one for a little bit, but then it'll go back to the old one. Then he might come back to the new one for a bit, but then it'll go back to the old one. Eventually, he'll come back to the new one, and he won't go back to the old one, and there you go, he's got the new bone. So he said, so it's going to be with Christ. You need to give these people Jesus, give them the option of Christ, what life is like with Christ, and so on. And guess what? Eventually, they're going to realize, when I pray to Jesus, things happen. When I pray to these other idols, Ganesh and Vishnu and Krishna and all these, nothing seems to happen, so I'm just going to keep coming back to Jesus, and eventually the penny drops that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we can, we can look at things in culture and go, we've got to tear these walls down. But here's the thing, if you tear them down and leave a vacuum, somebody's still going to build something in its place. And if the church is still just sitting there doing nothing, well, guess who's going to build stuff back in its place? And it's probably not going to be stuff built that's going to point the culture and society back towards Jesus. It's probably not. This is why I'm, 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 I'm saying this morning that, that there's a time for prayer. There genuinely is a time for prayer and seeking God, but there's a time for action too. There's a time to start to do things. It says in verse 8, it says that all these guys, the Arabs, Tobiah, and so on, they weren't happy about it, so they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble for it. Watch what Nehemiah says in verse 9. He says, but we prayed to our God and, everybody say and, and we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. In other words, we didn't just pray and say, well, God, if this is your will, Lord, that God, you just protect Jerusalem. This is your will, God. You just make sure the walls stay up. Lord, if this is your will, God, then, then we just know it's going to happen. They said, no, no, no. We're going to pray, but we're also going to put some guards there as well because prayer and action together make a huge difference. Amen? It's when we pray. If, if, if you're someone that's praying but also acting out on that prayer, 
I think you are a powerful person. You are that kind of righteous person that James talks about when he says the prayer of a righteous person avails much. A righteous person is not someone that hides behind prayer. A righteous person, I think, is somebody that lives right before God, right before society. You might know what's wrong and you're praying into that, but you're becoming an answer and a solution to your own prayers as well. And we've got to be prepared to start to do some things in our community, do some things in our society, if we genuinely want to see the correct walls built and the wrong walls built down, torn down. Amen? We've got to be prepared to do things. And here's the thing, if we're not prepared to do anything other than just sit in a, in a, in a, in a box and pray, I'm not saying don't do it, go and do it. But I'm just trying to say today that if all we want to do is pray for Lismore and Ganelaba in our community and not get our hands dirty and do anything outside these four concrete walls that we call a church, then we're, all we're going to really do is build up this happy little great community in here. And by the way, I'm all for our community. It's awesome. I think one thing we've done really, really well here is we've built community. But what good is this awesome community in here if nobody out there understands anything about it? What good is this awesome community in here if we're not inviting people in? Or better still, if we're not taking our community out there to the people? What good is this community if we're not providing opportunities for people to somehow begin to mesh in to the community of Christ, the body of Christ, and see that there is a way better way to live? People at their very core want to belong somewhere. It's one of the, one of the base traits of being a human is this desire to belong. That's why, that's why a six-year-old kid today is going to join a street gang in America knowing statistically he's going to be dead by 15 or 16. He's going to know that, but he's still going to do it. Why? Because he wants to belong somewhere. He doesn't have a home at home, maybe not a mum, not a dad, whatever. And these guys gather around and go, we'll be your brothers, we'll be your sisters, we'll be your mothers, we'll be your fathers. Come on in. And they do it. That's why kids give in to this thing we call peer pressure. Peer pressure is really not so much an external pressure to do, it's an internal pressure to want to belong. And if I do this, I get to belong there. I get to be a part of something bigger than myself. It's awfully quiet here. It's okay though, I don't mind. So what we see here in verse 9 is that they prayed, but they also did. Nehemiah wept when he heard what was going on in the city, but he also got up and said, well, hey, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to do something about this. Prayer was backed up by reciprocal action. And when we have that, that is a powerful thing in a community. It says that the walls were only built to half their height, so they hadn't finished it yet. But what I love is, hey, at least they started. Amen? At least they started. By this stage of the story, it's not like there's this ultimate victory and the whole society's transformed and so on. But here's the thing. Nothing's going to be transformed and changed until somebody starts something. Amen? I remember when we first moved to, uh, to uh, Ballina and uh, uh, we had um, and Caleb. Caleb went to Richmond Christian College down there in Ballina. Now, back in the day when Caleb went to Richmond Christian College, I think it was like one or two demandables. It was a dinky little school with hardly anybody there. And here's the thing, when you would talk to people and, and you're going to put your kid in that school, uh, there were a lot of people that simply said, I don't want to put my kid in that school. Why? Well, it's too small. Well, how do you think the thing's going to grow if you don't get involved? How do you think something little gets bigger if everybody goes, I'm just going to wait till there's 500 kids, then I'm going to support this Christian school. I really want Christian education, I really want, but I'm going to wait until this thing's really grown, pumping, big, flowing, got all its money in place, all its servants in place, all its, its, its people that have given up time and energy, all the creative. Once it's pumping, man, I'm going to jump in there and go, yeah, I want to be a part of this. But nothing gets pumping until people go, hey, I'm prepared to do a little bit of hard work here, Amen. I'm prepared to put my hand to the plow. I'm prepared to do a little bit of work here. Even when it's hard, I'll get a bit of sweat on my brow, a little bit of blood on my hands and so on. See, a lot of people want the benefits that come with a completed wall, but they don't want to be a part of the process of building. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here, and I threw this out last week, is I believe that as a gathering, we're going on 10 years, we've built a really good community of people within these walls. We've got our connect groups running. We've got a few little ministries that are, are sort of trying to reach out into the community and so on. But I feel like God is challenging us now and going, okay, there's a really strong foundation here. Now it's time to begin to build some things beyond just what benefits us. It's time to start to get out there in the community and look at ways that we can get involved in the community and start to, uh, if I can steal Donald Trump's make America great again, let's make Jesus great again. Let's make Jesus great again. Amen. 
Not that we're making him great, but you know what I'm saying. Paul says in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. I'll tell you what, the media are doing everything they can to make sure every Christian are very ashamed of the gospel by highlighting every single time somebody looks left when they should have looked right or looks right when they should have looked left. There's a big shame campaign to the point where a lot of believers, unfortunately, are now starting to want to distance themselves from, 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 from God, from church and so on, and go, well, I, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm really cool like you. I don't, I don't relate to those guys there. And the gospel is getting more and more and more watered down. And the more and more we water it down, the less and less of the power of the Holy Spirit we have because, see, God's not going to share his glory with anybody else. God's not going to support diluted things. Like God, God is God. At end of the day, God is God. That's just the way it is. I don't like it sometimes. <laughs> I actually don't like a lot of things that Jesus taught. I hate that stuff about deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me daily. I hate that stuff, you know? But it's there. Jesus taught it. He's my Lord. I guess I've got to believe it. I've got to live a life as if that's actually true. As if that's actually true. So there's a time to dream. There's a time to plan. There's a time to talk. There's a time to pray. But eventually there comes a time where you've got to start to do some things. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 23, 24. This is one of my favorite passages in the Psalms. It says this. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. That we fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. What I love there is this concept of that, that God gravitates towards movement, not intentions. It doesn't say the intentions of a righteous man or woman or person are ordered by God. God can't order your intentions. God can't do anything with your intentions. He does things with action. God does things with action. God gravitates towards movement. And when we start making some decisions, we start taking some steps, it says there that even though you fall, you're not going to be utterly destroyed. So guess what happens when we start making some decisions to start to do some things and walk in a direction? Guess what's going to happen? It's inevitable you're going to fall. But you don't stay down, you get back up. It's a part of the process. It's a part of God directing. Anyone ever had a child and, you know, children first start to walk and they're over here and they're on this one over this direction, you know, and you gently grab the arm because they don't want you walking over there. That's a cliff. And, and, you, yeah, and maybe they fall a little bit when they're being turned, but they get back up and then they just continue their, you know, orangutan walk along to, you know, wherever it is that they're, that they're going to. But there's a process. Walking and falling go hand in hand, but you're not going to fall if you don't walk. So if you don't want to fall, don't walk. There you go. There's a safety mechanism for you. If you're not the kind of person that wants to fall, then don't walk in the first place. But if you don't walk and you don't start, you're not going to go anywhere. We're not going to go anywhere. And as a church, I think God's stirring us up, going, hey, guys, it's time to go somewhere. Amen? It's time to actually start going somewhere. I mentioned last week this statement. I said the church is called to have impact in the community, but you can't have impact until you have influence in the community. And you can't have influence in a community until you have involvement in the community. It starts with getting involved in the community. And to have involvement, a local gathering needs three things. It needs money, it needs time, and it needs creativity. In the time we've got left, I just want to quickly unpack those three things very quickly. First thing is that in order to have influence and involvement in the community, the reality of the fact is that we need finance. Amen? And the crowd went really, really quiet. You know why? You're going to walk away and say, I'm not going back to that church. He said the F word in church. Finance, finance. Here's the thing. We, if, if you're a regular member, I, 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 I'm apologizing to the new people that have come on in today and this is your first time because I hope you didn't walk in and go, here we go, money again. I was a pastor in another movement years and years ago, a long time ago now, and resigned from that and had a few years away from pastoring and we, we came back here. One of the reasons why we resigned was because I got sick of hearing about money, if I'm just being brutally honest. I get sick of hearing about money in church. I, I, I could go to church and I could guarantee that in the 52 weeks in a year, I'd hear four messages about grace and maybe three about love and maybe you know, a handful about missions and, and about this and that and that, but I was going to get 52 talks about money. And I sat back one day and went, man, no wonder the world thinks all we want is your money in the church. Right? That was an extreme thing, talked about money too much. My problem is I've swung the complete opposite way and I never talk about finances. And those of you that call this place home would know that. We've been going for 10 years and I can count on one hand the amount of messages I've given on finances in 10, nearly 10 years. I don't like talking about it. I find it hard to talk about. But at the same time, the Bible doesn't seem to have a big problem 
talking about money, and that's just the truth. That's not me making that up. You can have a look at how often uh, the Bible talks about money. It talks about money uh, a lot. In fact, the word believe is used about 272 times in the New Testament. Pray is used about 371. Love is used about 714. Give is used over 2,100 times. Generosity is a really, really important part of being a believer. So I don't like talking about money, but that's because I'm at the other extreme of the pendulum, unlike the guys that want to talk about money as if it's the only thing that's really, really important. The thing I've learned about money is that money has nothing really to do with finance. Money has everything to do with a heart. What I love about Jesus' teaching on money is that money is a heart issue, not a finance issue. It's not a dollar issue. It's a heart issue. There's a reason why the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, you know, I've, uh, what have I got to do to get eternal life? You know, obey this law, that rule, that. They said, man, I've done it all. Dude, I've done every single one of them. I've dotted my eyes and crossed my T's. And Jesus said to this rich young guy, one thing you're lacking. He said, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, come follow me. And the guy turned around and walked away with a heavy heart. And it says that Jesus had pity on him. Jesus had sorrow on that guy. Now, Jesus didn't tell every rich person to go and sell everything. He came across a lot of people that had quite a amount of wealth and he never told them all to go and sell it. Why? Because maybe their hearts were in the right place when it came to that. This particular person, the money, the wealth, the finance, that was the very thing that was stopping him following God. So when we talk about finance, it's not so much a money issue, it's so much a heart issue. But here's what I know about money. My money follows where my heart's gone. It does. My money follows where my heart goes. If I'm online and I look at a brand new Daewa fishing reel, that, that, the, the pitch, I see a guy guaranteeing that I'm going to catch a mangrove jack like this if I buy that reel. And uh, you know, if I put this line on it and so on. And, and if I see that and all of a sudden my heart gravitates towards that thing, you know, it's going there next, don't you? I'm punching numbers in a thing and bang, I bought myself a reel. And when it comes, I go fishing once with it and I didn't catch anything. So it goes back in the box I've got with my other 37 fishing reels just waiting till I can crack the right code and get the right reel. But w when our heart goes somewhere, our finances follow that thing. That's why Jesus spoke so much about, and he did, he spoke a lot about finances and so on. But I don't want to labour on money. I wonder if you've ever thought about this with the following organisations. Let me throw some thoughts at you. Do you really think McDonald's just wants to save you time? You really think McDonald's just want to save you time? McDonald's exists just to get you in and out, fast food. We just want to get you quick food. Do you think that's really the whole motivation behind McDonald's? All they care about is getting you food really, really quickly, getting you in and out? Do you really think the Weight Watchers just want you to be healthy? That's it. Just want you to be healthy. In 2017, the Weight Watchers CEO earned 33.4 million. In fact, in 2017, the average CEO got a decent-sized fast food or retail company. They were getting about 13.94 million. But all they really care about is getting you in and out with a quick burger. That's really the motivation. Uh, I think there's a few other motivations thrown in there too. But have you ever gone to McDonald's and stopped? And go, I'm not giving you my money because all you want to do is put the money in the shareholders' pockets. No, you don't. Just give me the cheeseburger, baby. There you go. <laughs> hey? We, we, don't think about, we don't think about that with all these other organisations out there, but you start thinking about money in a church. We think about it totally different. But I can tell you one thing. Uh, for example, my salary doesn't go up if giving goes up. There's a board, there is, uh, is structures above me and an organisational thing above me that keeps all that stuff in check. Um, uh, and, and I have to say that because um, I, I have a friend who works with churches and, and uh, as an accountant and goes in and uh, uh, audits a whole bunch of organisations and some of the things he tells me about some churches, I do have to say that that's not how it works here. You know, some, unfortunately, there are churches out there that do do things with money that, that uh, you know, might be a little bit un. Uh, becoming, and some of them do things that are extremely unbecoming for a church and a, and a minister, a man or woman of God. But that stuff's out there. But the, the truth is that nothing changes for us when we give more, when giving goes up in this place. Now, by the way, let me say, we've been going for 10 years financially, and God has sustained us for 10 years. That's one of the reasons why we don't need to talk a lot about money. We have generous people here. But when it comes to this next season, this next phase we're going into, it is important that we realise and we know that we can only do what we can do. A part of the component to do the things we need to do and want to do in the community is we do need finances to do that. I don't know if you know, but the government are not paying us money to preach the gospel to people. I haven't, I'm waiting for the check, the, the gospel check that comes. Look, we're going to allocate you guys uh, $100,000 in the year 2025 just to tell people that Jesus loves them. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Here's your $100,000, you know? It's not happening. It hasn't happened, and I dare say it's not going to happen. 
If we're going to do that sort of stuff, when we were missionaries in India, we were doing great things, but we were over there to tell these people about Jesus. The government did not give us money. Hey, we're going to support you because you know what? You're doing a great thing over there. Let's get them Hindu heathen to follow Christ. There you go, the money. It doesn't work like that. Who supports the preaching of the gospel? Well, you can go and read the New Testament if you want. The letter of Philippians, Corinthians, Colossians, you go and read it. It's very, very clear the preaching of the gospel is supported by people who have been impacted by the gospel themselves. That's where the finance comes from. Do you really think Bunnings just want to give you the lowest possible price? Really, that's their whole motivation. We just want, we don't care if we don't make a dollar today. We just want you to have the lowest possible prices. Well, the CEO gets his $14 million check at the end of the year. Do you think Nike just want your feet to be comfortable? <laughs> eh? Or to just play basketball like Michael Jordan? Do eh. you really think Myers just want you to look your best? Come on. All these organisations out there that at the end of the day we invest money into them and we know that that money is going to give us a product that's very temporary, moth and rust is going to destroy it eventually and the profits are going to go into CEO's pocket and they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But we don't have a problem with them wanting our money, asking for our money, taking our money, but the minute somebody mentions finances in church we go, I think we have a wrong concept of finance and money. It's funny, I, I, I meet people, right? Somebody comes up to me randomly and I've never met him before. Dave, how you doing, Dave? And the conversation goes like this. Hey, Dave, my name's Alan. Hey, what do you do for a living, Dave? Oh, I'm a drummer. Oh, yeah, are you really? You got any, got a, got a, you're married? Yes. You got any kids? Yeah. What, oh, how old are your kids? Uh, they're old. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, and how much money do you earn? Uh... <laughs> Isn't it funny? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you all my children's names. I'll tell you where I live. I'll tell you my wife's name. I'll tell you. But don't ask me how much money I earn. I'm going to do I'm not saying we should be telling everybody how much we earn. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, again, that tells me something. I hold money in a place that's probably the wrong place. I think money is probably more important than things that it's actually not more important than. There's an issue that sometimes we have, and that's a hard issue between us and God. But all I want to say today, the point I want to make is this, is going forward to do some of the things we want to do to try to reach into the community for Christ, just be prepared. It's, we're going to need finances to do some of that stuff. That's all I want to throw out at you this morning when it comes to, uh, to finances. So uh, let's, let's, let's move on. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 and 8. I'll just throw this at you. Paul, and he's speaking specifically of finances in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, each of you should give. Now, everyone say that, each of us. He says this, each of you should give, right? So he makes it very clear that everybody should give. Everybody's got something they can contribute financially to the gospel. Everybody's got something, all right? It might not be this much, it might be that much. It doesn't matter, but we all have something we can contribute. He says each of you should give, but he says this is how you give. You give what you've decided in your heart to give. There it is. It's the heart again, isn't it? He's saying give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Do not give out of reluctance or compulsion. If you're giving out of compulsion because you feel manipulated or compelled or bent and twisted to give, that's the wrong reason to give. As a matter of fact, I don't care where I am. If I'm at a church conference and they're up the front and I feel somebody manipulating me to give, I don't give. It's just simple as that. Because I go back to this and go, I was going to give if you just let me give out of my heart, but you want to try to twist my heart around. I'm sorry you've lost me. Sorry you've lost me. I was at a conference once and a guy stood up and we had a guest speaker. This is many years ago. And he said, now we're going to take up an offering. There was about 2,000 people in the room. He said, here's how it works. If you give a lot, that's your way of saying to Jesus, this man's ministry meant a lot to me. And if you give a little, that's your way of saying to him, this family meant a little bit to me. And I took my money and I put it back in my pocket and went, no, you're not getting anything out of me now. Like, that's just, it's wrong. That's not why we give. You see, our money goes where our heart is. The challenge for us is, is our heart in getting the gospel to people that don't know Jesus? Is our heart there? And if it's not, that's okay. That's okay. But maybe what we can do is we can start personally in a place of prayer. They go, Father, give me your heart for those that don't know you, God. Lord, give me your heart for those that are not in relationship with you because I'm working next to them every day at work. I, I'm, I, they, they, they're taking my money at Woolworths every day when I go and buy my groceries. Yeah, they're fixing my car. They, 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 they're sitting next to me at school. Uh, Lord, would you give me, give me your heart for these people? Let me experience, let me feel your heart for a lost and dying world. See, if, if Christ gets your heart, then he'll get everything else. It's that simple. Yeah. Amen. When Christ has our heart, because that's what he wants, more than your money. Please, please hear me very clearly. If you're here this morning and you're, you're thinking this, we're talking about money, 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 let me make it very clear. Money is nothing. God wants your heart. 
God wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants you to uh, align yourself with him. He wants you to accept the fact that you're a sinner, that you're in need of a savior. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you human because all of us are sinners. And all of us are in need of a saviour. And none of us will ever be good enough to measure up to the standards of God because God is absolute perfection. It's just that simple. The beauty of this is that absolute perfection was prepared to create a way for us when he knew we couldn't create a way for ourselves. God knew we would never be good enough to reach up, so through Jesus he reached down to us. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And he's not waiting for you to give up your addiction to pornography. He's not waiting for you to give up your addiction to alcohol. He's not waiting for you to to be a more loving person. He's not waiting for you to become more religious or stop swearing. He's not waiting for you to pray more. He's not waiting for you. He's not waiting for that stuff. He's not waiting for anything else. He's just there right now, nearer than you could possibly think, saying, all I want you to do is open your heart to me. Invite me in. And you might not even know the full breadth of what that means. When I, at 19 years of age, when I gave my life to Jesus, I actually didn't really have a clue what it meant. I didn't have a clue that my life would go the way that it did. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I just knew that, you know what, I think there's a God out there. I believe that. And, and, and if you can take my life and do something with it, then I'm prepared to surrender myself. I don't even know what surrender means. You know? I mean, I even said to God on that roundabout, I actually threw two challenges uh, at the Lord. And I won't go into detail what they were, but basically I said to him, God, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some things tonight that I know you probably don't like. But I'm going to go and do them anyway. (laughs) You know? Even in spite of all that, the grace of God was so incredible for me. And he said, I can work with that. If you give me a heart, I can work with you. If you give me a heart, I can work with you. Amen? Jesus wants our heart. James Craft. Anyone ever, ever eat Craft Singles, the cheese? And remember that when you were younger? I don't know. Do they still make them? Craft Singles, the cheese, processed cheese, by the way, in a plastic wrapper. And anyone, anyone ever, when they were a kid, forget to take the wrapper off and just put it between the bread and <laughs> eat it? I used to do it all the time. You'd chuck the cheese on, it still had the plastic wrapper, and you'd bite into it, and your mouth full of plastic and that, you know, because you know somebody else didn't take the cheese off for me. It's always somebody else's fault. Um, James Craft in 1903, 1903, James Craft invented Philadelphia cream cheese. Now, who doesn't like cream cheese? Hey? I used to love cream cheese. Now I'm 52 for various bodily reasons. Cream cheese is my enemy. Okay, I can't have cream cheese anymore. It's not pretty. But in, two, in 1903, he invented Philadelphia cream cheese. Now, since then, his company Kraft Cheese it went on to make him and his wife incredibly, incredibly rich. But his attitude towards investing is best summed up in a comment he made. He said this. He said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. The only investment I've made, this is James Kraft. You didn't know that. Every time you're eating Kraft, you probably prayed over that cheese, right? That's probably why you're here. <laughs> anointed cheese. Everyone's going to go out now and we're going to buy Kraft cheese because it's anointed. It's prayed over, made by Christian hands. Well, it was back in the day. But he said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. Imagine if someone told you this. They said, look, I'm not going to bother with fruit and vegetables. That's, ugh, who likes fruit and veggies, you know? I don't like exercise, so that's not going to happen. Water, water doesn't have any fizz, hey, Ben? Water's got no fizz, so who wants to drink that stuff? And sunlight, well, sunlight can actually burn you, so it's really not worth the vitamin D hit. But I'm just believing God that he'll miraculously sustain my health. You'd probably think they were an idiot, right? You'd probably think that's, eh. But I'm convinced that that's how a lot of Christians feel when it comes to what God wants to do through the church. We'll do whatever we want with our finances and we'll just believe God to miraculously sustain anything he wants to do, apart from our involvement, but it just doesn't work like that. Paul goes on, 2 Corinthians 9, 10 and 11, he says, now, still speaking of finances, he says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, he'll supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest. See, bread, he says, he gives you bread and he says he gives you seed, two things. You eat your bread, go hard. Put butter on that sucker, put Vegemite, put peanut butter, whatever you want. You do what you want with the bread. Share it with your neighbour, eat it for yourself, make a sandwich for your kids, toast it, make French toast. You do whatever you want with your bread. But Paul says to the Corinthians, but he also gives you seed. Gives you seed to sow. And I wonder if the church in the West wouldn't be doing a lot more things out there in the community if we weren't eating our seeds. Every time you eat a seed, you kill its God-ordained potential to produce something else. 
Every time we eat a seed, we kill its God-ordained potential to produce something else because seeds are not to be eaten. Seeds are there to produce, increase and produce something else. And he goes on, he says, you'll be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And I love this last bit and I'll finish on this. He says, and through us, your generosity, your generosity, my generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Our generosity will result in people coming to faith People being given opportunity to hear the good news of of Jesus. People coming to spaces where they get to drop their guard, drop their masks, be themselves, realize that God loves them and accepts them as they are. And as they begin to come into relationship with Jesus, as they begin to discover their value and their worth, not a value they earn, but a value that's been given to them. Not an identity they have to create out there, but an identity given to them by God. As they start to discover that, then people begin to give thanks to God. All because you and I played a little role in creating spaces and contributing and being a part of building places that people could come to hear the gospel message. They're not going to hear it. They're not going to hear it everywhere. That's just the reality of the world we live in. They're taking prayer out of places. They're taking Bible reading out of places. And the spaces that exist to hear the gospel message are, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But we can work together and create spaces. We can tear down some walls where Jesus is not allowed inside there and we can, put, we can build walls up in right places and we can play our role and probably probably if we dare to dream and think big wow couldn't we do some amazing things in our community get the band back we're going to finish let's get the band back i haven't covered everything i'll we'll cover a couple more things next week but i want to throw let me throw a picture at you just to think about where are we i don't know where it is but it's in here How awesome would it be? We're here because we we're meant to be here. We're not just here because it's a cool place. God put us here. All right? Now, just dream with me. I mean, you ever seen that movie? Anyone ever seen that old movie, Being John Malkovich? Where they went inside John Malkovich's head and it was all crazy. And Anyone ever seen that movie? No, we're Christians. We don't watch that. I haven't either. <laughs> Christians, we don't watch that stuff. I'm telling you now, if you get up inside my head, There's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of good stuff. So here's here's what I see. I've I've got a simple definition of faith. Faith is believing in that which you can't see, but living as if you can. Here's what I can see. You don't have to see it, that's fine. I'm just going to open my heart. You can tread on it if you want to. Imagine. Here's a rise. A city on a hill. Imagine if we had a youth drop-in centre where young kids could come, play some pool, some, what do you call that game? Ping pong, table tennis. We've got some great men and women of God that are in there building relationships with these kids. Maybe it... uh, Maybe at 5.30 every evening, we go up the stairs to a little room, we do a Bible study. Any kids, if you're interested in knowing a bit, you're free to come on up. Mums and dads love the place because it's safe. We can send our kids there for a few hours in the afternoon and we know they're going to have fun. It's going to be cool. And we're providing that space, but also we're praying for these kids, man. We're praying. God, when they come in here, Lord, we want these kids to know Jesus. That's the, the end goal is this. We want them to know Jesus. Imagine having a coffee shop. Imagine having a coffee shop where people could come along, grab a coffee. Better than the stuff we serve now. I'm just prefacing by saying that. People could meet in a nice, safe place. Have a coffee. Have a catch-up. Have a chat with their friends. I don't know why we're here, but we're here. God's put us here. This piece of dirt's ours right now. Imagine creating a space where people could connect and people start getting comfortable coming on this space here because, you know, nobody wants to go to a church. A church is a church. You don't go near them. But now it's not just a church. It's a coffee shop. And that's our coffee shop. We go to that coffee shop. We love that coffee shop. They do things really well there. It's got a great atmosphere. It's welcoming. From the coffee shop, we've got some others that come along to play and pray. What's, what's Sarah Lucas not here? Play and pray. Sarah runs this play and cry group. 
As mothers come along and hear about play and pray, maybe some of the mothers come along to that and start bringing their kids along. And What do they do? Well, the kids play, and at a certain point in the, in the program, they go, we're going to pray. We've got mothers that come along to that that don't know Jesus, but they're starting to come along. Imagine, imagine having a, 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 a place, a, 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 a bit of a health, whole health centre where you had a Christian psychologist that was prepared to meet. All legal, I'm, I'm not talking about illegal, I'm talking about dotting every I, crossing every T, making sure everything's right with council, government, all that stuff. But we, we, we could offer some Christian counselling, Christian psychologists. We, we, we could offer dietitians and all this sort of stuff that aren't going to slowly take you down weird, new agey kind of paths. And I don't mean to offend anybody with that phrase. But imagine a hub. Imagine some of these things we could do to begin to build relationship with the community. Then imagine in 15 years' time, 10 years' time. Imagine, and this is not hard to imagine, imagine if the government and councils around the country started saying, we're putting caps on churches now, we don't need so many. And so we're going to get rid of a few. So you guys up there in the industrial estate, we don't need you. I'm sorry, you've got 12 months. You need to go. Imagine if the community turned around and said, hey, you might not want them there, but we do. Because they're doing a great thing with our kids. They're providing some great services. They put on some events. We have barbecues up there. They put games nights on for the families in the community. They have monthly pizza bake-ups. We'd love to get some big pizza ovens, put them around the side of the building there. And once a month, say to the community, make your pizzas at home with your kids, bring them up. And we'll put a big movie on here for the kids in here and the parents grab your deck chairs, whatever, and we'll cook the pizzas up in a pizza oven and just a big community gathering. We would love to do some of these things. We would love to be a blessing to the community that God has placed us in for a strategic reason in a strategic time such as this. I've got so much more that I want to share, but we kind of got a bit sidetracked with a few other things this morning. Hey, would you stand with me this morning? Let's just stand. <coughs> Let's just stand. Hey, we are... We, we, we're finished per se, okay? So if you need to leave, uh, for those of you visiting, we're normally done well and truly by now. We try to wrap up around 20 past 11, quarter past 11 if we can. Um, we've just gone on a little bit longer. I, I, I appreciate you hanging around. Uh, through that door there, there's tea and coffee. Please don't feel like you've got to run. Feel free to go in there, grab a tea and a coffee. Uh, the coffee's probably better than I'm making it sound, but maybe it's not. I don't know. You be the judge. Um, feel free. If you need to leave, feel free to leave. But what we're going to do, it's going to get these guys to just lead us in a song. We're just going to worship God. I'm, my challenge to you this week is this. I want you to ask God. I want you to ask the Lord. Where, 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 where are you at in terms of what we're talking about? Are you ready to be a part of a community to put your hand to the plough? Are you prepared to go, you know what, I want more than just to meet in a building with 120 other people, as awesome as what that is. I want more than just great worship. I want more than, you know, hopefully a decent message. Uh, I want more than just things that are just here to, 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 to benefit us as a community, as important as these are. But you know what? I really want to be a part of something, Lord, that's going to reach the community. I want to be a part of something that's going to take Jesus in the name of Jesus outside the walls of the church. That's my challenge to you for the next week. Sit with the Lord. Just sit with God. And if you don't want to go on that journey, that's fine. There's still a place here for you. There's still a place here for you. But we're ready to go somewhere. Amen? We're ready to take some steps of faith. And here's the thing. I know we're going to get it wrong. I know we're going to fall over. But I know by the grace of God, we're going to get up. And we're going to redirect. And we're just going to keep on going till we find that thing, that place, those spaces where God's breathing life. So, Father, we commit this uh, thought to you, Lord, this morning, God. Matthew 28, Jesus, you said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And for whatever reason, God, you have placed us in this part of all the world. And Father, we will not dare subcontract our community out to somebody else. As your people, this is our responsibility to shine a light here. This is our responsibility to be salt. This is our responsibility to take the name of Jesus. 
and to share it with people in our community. It's, it's our responsibility. This is our home. This is our place. This is where you've called us, God. And Father, I pray for each of us in this room in these next seven days. Would you stir our hearts, Father? Would you give us your heart for the community that we are in, Lord? God, would you begin to release the finances that we need to do the things that we want to do? God, would you begin to challenge us uh, to give the time to the things that we need to give time to? And Father, would you challenge us also in the area of creativity, that, Lord, we would have creative ways, God, to be a blessing to the community that you've placed us in. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. And I pray for each of us in the next seven days when we leave this place. God, would you give each of us in this room, everybody that calls on your name, would you give each of us an opportunity to tell one person about the goodness of God? Give us the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, somebody that right now doesn't know what you've done for them and how much you love them. God, would you give us the privilege of sharing that message with somebody in Jesus' name? And everybody said, Amen. 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 Feel free to leave, tea, coffee, worship, whatever you want to do. God bless you guys. We'll catch you later.